morning again, church. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn with me to Luke 14. Luke chapter 14 is where we will be studying today, verses 25 through 33. So go ahead and find that as we get into it today. We're continuing our series through Jesus' parables in the book of Luke, where we are going to be confronted again today with the reality of what it means to be a kingdom citizen, where the values of God's kingdom are many ways opposite to what the way of the world is. Getting into it today, though, I want to take you back about 16 months ago to a time in my life that I believe has changed my life forever. See, it was a Wednesday night, uh, a long day of ministry up here, and I get home and, and I feel this low-grade dizziness. So I thought, well, it's just like exhaustion. I'm going to go to bed and wake up tomorrow. I'll be all fine. But over the next couple of days, it, it just got steadily worse to where that Sunday I couldn't even be here. Brett had to fill in last minute to preach. And that dizzy feeling would, would come and go over the next couple of weeks where at times it would be really, really bad. At times it would be almost disappearing. But it all came to a head that first week of April, Easter week, where on that Wednesday I was in the ER right across the street here because it was so bad, I couldn't function. We thought, maybe I've got a tumor, we're doing CT scans, we just don't know what it is, trying to figure it out. I had to miss Good Friday that week up here, and it was just a terrible few days, but I was not missing Easter Sunday, right? That's like the Super Bowl for us. And so I was here, had someone pick me up and drive me here that morning, and I was so unstable that I had to sit in a chair, low chair right here to preach my head was tilted about five degrees off because my brain was off, and, and I, I got up and I stumbled off like I was on a cruise ship walking off the stage after I was done. I think, we're not totally sure what it was, but we think it was a virus that landed in my inner ear and kind of blew up your balance system and that finely tuned system that it is. But let me just give you a glimpse of how terrible it was for those stretches of time during those weeks last year. So I'm, I'm laying there and the room feels like it's spinning around me. My eyes were tracking movement that wasn't there because I couldn't stop it. And thankfully, those stretches of time after Easter Sunday just began to slowly fade away where I started in a chair and then, you know, next week I was in a stool and then over the course of that summer it was like a stool and I was standing some and then sitting some and it was fun to watch the dynamic. Some kids were, hey, you're standing more today, like that kind of thing as up here to where now I, I feel completely normal in that. So praise the Lord for that. But here's why I share all that. See, many of you walked with us through that, so I want to say thank you again for helping serve our family through that. Many of you are new, knew nothing about that at all, and so this is all news, but, but here's why I share that. See, in those stretches where I'm laying flat on my back, couldn't move without feeling like I was gonna lose my lunch, right? I, I, I couldn't do anything. I got to a pretty dark place. I mean, I, I couldn't sleep, couldn't watch TV, I, I couldn't read, I couldn't play with my sons, I, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't distract myself from the chaos that was going on in my body and in my life at the time. And so I'm just laying there in my thoughts, in my fears, haven't slept for days, wondering, am I ever going to work again? Like, will I ever be able to drive a car again or was spinning coming on? I, will I ever be useful at home? I'm watching my sons uncertain about the future because they've never seen me really suffer like that and I can't do anything and my wife carrying such an incredibly heavy burden for that stretch of time where I couldn't help. Like, it was the most emotionally draining time of my life. Shed many tears, just wrestling internally with that. But here's what Jesus did through that in me. You, you remember seeing those like crime detective TV shows or movies where, where they're bringing the perpetrator in for questioning, 
and, and they bring him in this little room, and there's one little table with one little light bulb sitting right up, hanging up above it, and, and there's the chair for the detective, and then there's the chair for the perpetrator, and the detective's asking questions, and, and it's just that scene, right? You, you get that scene in your head. That's what Jesus did with me. So I imagine him, I can almost visualize what I felt in that moment where I'm, I'm sitting there and he sits me down across the table. Everything else in my life is stripped away. I have no distractions. I can't distract my mind. I can't do anything. And Jesus almost audibly asked me the question in that setting, am I enough for you? If you get none of that back, if you can never preach again, if you can't work, if you have to be driven everywhere, if you have to take medicine your whole life, if you can't work out like you did before, if you can't play with your sons, if you can't do any of that, if, I, if none of that ever comes back, Jesus asks me, am I enough for you? Is Jesus enough? Transparently, I've never really had to answer that question before. I, I, I've, I've always had enough. Like I've never been to the end of myself like that where, where I had nothing else. Where I was fully dependent on him and even on others in that moment where, where I was unable to do anything. It was a piercing question. But I want you to hear me today. Jesus is asking every single one of us that same question. Is he enough for you? Is Jesus enough? Or is it, yes, Jesus, as long as I have this too, as long as I have enough money, as long as I don't suffer too bad, as long as I have some comforts to, or is Jesus enough? It's the question he asked me, continually asks me. That's the question he asks here in Luke 14. Starting in verse 25, look at what he says to the crowds here. Now great crowds accompanied Jesus and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other's yet a great way off, he sends a delegation, asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus, we need you today. These are hard words. Open our ears to hear, open our eyes to see, open our hearts to receive your word for us today. Don't let us temper this, run away from this, God, May we face this full on with what you want to teach us and change in us today for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let me give you a, a memorable way to, to think about what Jesus is teaching here in this passage. Just the, the idea that you can walk away with, that, that you see him teaching here is that Jesus wants 
followers, not fans. There's a well-known book that talks about this, but, but that's the idea here. Jesus wants followers, not fans. Now, you understand the difference, right? A fan is someone who, who likes, maybe even loves the team, but is not 100% invested. Right? They, they are up in the stands. They stay up in the stands. In fact, many, many fans will, will even turn on you, be critical when it doesn't go their way. I know this firsthand. In 2001, homecoming against Colorado, Everybody loved the trick play that I completed the long pass and it was a play of the game and all of that. But then at the end of the game, when I dropped a pass on the game-winning drive, they were yelling at me like I was worthless. See, a fan not only gets critical, but a fan leaves early when the game's not in hand and they don't they don't see the end result, and they don't like the results, and so they leave. Bail. A follower, though, is like a player actually on the team, committed to the team, involved in the team, sinks with the team when losing, full on, and rises with the team when winning, full on, because they are 100% committed to it. And here with this parable and all of the parables, Jesus is separating those two groups. He's separating fans from followers. What he's doing is he's getting people to think about the reason they're following him, but also think about the cost involved to follow him. And so what we consider today as we also inherent in this passage is this same call to us today to follow him like he was implying for those who were following him in that moment. And so as we hear the call to follow Jesus, we are reminded of his invitation. This invitation to follow him is all over the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, 22 times at least the words, follow me, come out of Jesus' mouth in those Gospels. Where he's either talking to a person, he's talking to a group, or in, just in general, he's talking to his disciples that this was what people should do, is saying, follow me. Follow me was his invitation. That's really to Jesus, the essence of of lordship and, and salvation to him, that, that we are saved not to a theological principle, we're saved to a person. And not just mental beliefs, we're saved to Jesus. In fact, that's the word disciple. What it means is follower. So these disciples of Jesus, they were merely followers, which means to follow someone around. A disciple followed someone, here Jesus, could be a number of different rabbis, a follower of that person was also learning how to imitate that person, to do what they did, to say what they say, think like they thought. So a disciple is a follower, an imitator. So when we talk about disciple making around here a lot, what we mean by that is we are helping someone learn how to imitate Jesus. It's simple. That's all we're talking about. It's not some theological teaching and all the depth of that. That's part of it, but it's not just that. It's also saying, here's how you love someone. Let me show you. This is how Jesus did it. So let's how, this is how we should do it as well. So there's this call that we see to us even today to follow Jesus. But as we've seen here, there's some stipulations to following Jesus, right? There, there's a cost involved here. We must count that cost to follow Jesus. As we hear the call, let's not forget the cost. Imagine, again, Jesus sitting across that table from you from me. And he says these words here in Luke 14, and he, he says that to you, and, and you're thinking the same thing that I'm thinking as I'm reading this. You're like, now, wait a second, Jesus. Hold up. What you're telling me here is that I have to hate my family? You're, you're telling me that I, I have to die on a cross to follow you? that I gotta sell everything I have and go live under a bridge? Is that, is that what you're saying, Jesus, that I have to do that to follow you? 
And it sounds radical. That's why we temper this, right? We kind of say, well, that's not really what he meant. It's not the only time he said this. In fact, in Luke chapter 9, where he had just told them he's going to die on a cross, he said this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? And listen, he was serious about that because of what he says next in verse 26. He says, whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory. What he means is that what I just said, you better take it seriously. Pick up your cross, die. I mean what I say, that there's a cost to follow Jesus. See, true discipleship requires total dedication. But even as we say this, there's, there's one, at least one way we can get confused on this. Again, we hear these words. Jesus, do you literally mean we have to hate our families and our stuff? It's, Jesus, do you, do you mean I, I hate my wife? Here's where understanding Jewish culture is helpful. Because when they would use the word hate, they didn't use it like we think of bitterness and anger and and all that involved in hatred. They didn't use it that way. They used it in a way that it was just that you loved something else so much more. That you loved this comparatively so much that it seems like you hate the rest of it. In fact, Jesus says it this way in Matthew 10, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. It's what he says here in Luke 14, just in a little different way. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's what he's saying is you love me so much that it seems like you hate your family. means what Jesus was saying in Luke 14 was that him being in first place in your life totally overwhelms the natural love you have for your family members. I served on staff with a man in Stillwater at a church, and, and as he left that church, he moved him and his family to Southeast Asia to be missionaries to an unreached people group there. They had multiple kids when they left. They had multiple kids over there. They now have nine. And so that was quite the sight, walking around Southeast Asia. But I remember him telling me something after he had announced that, that they were called to move over there, and, and he had someone come up to him and ask him this question to his face. Do you hate your kids? We kind of chuckle about that a little bit, but, but what they meant by that question was that he was taking them out of the safety and security of America. And he was taking them and depriving them from the conveniences and comforts that we have here. He was moving them away from family and from friends. And on and on we could go. Do you hate your kids? And what he told me in that conversation was that when we obey Jesus as we should, it will probably look like to the world that we really do hate our family. It will appear like we are depriving or hurting them. We hate them. In reality, it's just that we love Jesus so much more than all of this. And the way that we best love our family is by following him wholeheartedly. That's actually the right way to love your family is to put him first. And if he calls, he calls, and you go, and they see that, that Jesus is king of your life. That's the absolute best way. Even to the point where Jesus says here, we must be willing, if he calls, to give up our very lives. Now, he might not ask that of you. But I think it's healthy at times to consider if he does ask that of you, 
Are you willing? If he puts you in a situation where you have to give your life for him, are you willing? Because remember, the cross he asked us to pick up is an instrument of death. So he says, do that. Would you be willing? Because when he was saying that to his hearers, they fully understood what he meant. Because maybe earlier that day, or maybe the week before, or the month before, they had heard Roman soldiers look at someone and say, take up your cross and follow me. So they knew when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, they understood that meant effectively, I must consider myself already dead. It's the best illustration of self-denial. It's not my life. I've died, Galatians 2.20, crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I have given it up for him. I've already chosen to die to myself. Jesus says it like this in John 12. He says, whoever loves his life, clings to his life, loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world, meaning loves Jesus more than this life, whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. See, that's what I wrestled with last year. If I'm going to follow Jesus wholeheartedly like he calls me to, then I must not place ultimate value on anything else than him. Everything else is secondary to living for him, to obeying him, to worshiping him. It all comes second. Even the good things in life, even, even my own physical life, it all comes secondary to his pursuit And then Jesus told these two parables that, that don't lower the bar in any way, right? Remember what they said in Luke 14? Which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? Whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build, is not able to finish. Like, look at how nice his foundation looks. That's it. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet whom who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation, asks for terms of peace. He's not able to meet that, so he says, man, I've got to protect myself and limit my damage here, so I'm going. So you look at this, and you think... What's the dominant word that Jesus uses over and over and over in that passage? It's the word able. You see it here, verse 29, is he able to finish? Verse 30, is he able to finish? Verse 31, is he able with 10,000 to go against 20,000? Verse 32, it's implied he's not able to go against that big army, and so he asks for peace. Even verse 28, does he have enough to complete it? That's talking ability, right? That word able, in fact, is related to the original Greek word dunamis. Many of you know that word already where it's, it's, it's the word for power. It's where we get our English word dynamite. It happens to be on July 4th weekend. I didn't plan that. But, but you see, like the point is the power able to do it. In fact, the word that's negative of that is the same word cannot be in those same verses. When Jesus said in verse 27, you cannot be my disciple, it's the same word. Able to do this, able to do this cannot be. So you look at verse 27 a little differently. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me is not able to be my disciple. Does not have the power, the capacity, the capability to be. And that's the fundamental question Jesus is asking the crowd, asking us. Are you able to follow me? 
The word able over and over, that's the power, the dunamis power, like the capacity. Are you able to follow Jesus? Do you have the power to follow Jesus? Now, theologically, we understand none of us are. There's not one of us who has the ability in our dead, sinful selves to follow him. We cannot do it. Our hearts must be awakened by faith to his grace for us, giving us new hearts that then want to follow him, want to give up everything for him. It starts with God. But what Jesus was doing with these parables was he was weeding out the fans who might merely be attracted to him for the benefits that he offers. In fact, there's an illustration of this in John chapter 6, where Jesus had just fed the 5,000 with a Hebrew happy meal. Everybody's excited. They want more food, so they show up in greater numbers. Everybody's excited. Get some more. Get some more. More miracles. And Jesus turns to them and says, no, wait. Actually, what you need is not food. You need me. And it says many fans, we would say, turned away and walked off when it got a little too hard. When it didn't turn out the way they wanted it to, they left. See, he's weeding the fans out. People like this are only in it for themselves. They want just a show of miracles, or they want heaven, or they just want provision, or they just want an easier life, or whatever it is. They certainly do not want to repent and deny themselves and follow him in full obedience. See, that's what we call easy believism, cheap grace, that this, yeah, it's a part of my life, but this is really where I want to live my life. That's why Jesus said both parables. They're intended to beg that question, are you able, dunamis, are you able to follow me? Do you have the capacity to do it? Because it cannot merely be an emotional decision. Following Christ cannot just be based on how you feel. You kind of got swept up in the moment at camp. You were, you were really sad one day, and so you came to Jesus. It's not about that. There must also be this reality. Because remember, Jesus did not want fickle fans who were in it for the parties. He wanted faithful followers who were in it for a purpose. That purpose was to follow him, see him as king over everything in their lives. And listen, here's the reality. You're either a follower of Christ or you're not. There are not two levels of Christianity. Like there's there's this level of people who are really committed and then there's this level of people who, who are more engaged with other aspects of life but still claim to be Christians. No, that's... Just, there's no category for that in the Bible. There's, there's not like Christian and then disciple. Like those are the serious ones. They're taking it seriously, but I'm okay. No, in the, in the categories of God's word, there is disciple up here. That's it. You are either a follower, a disciple, or you are not. And listen, we need to hear this, church. We in America need to be regularly reminded that God is not calling us to a comfortable middle-class lifestyle where it's all about us. Like where somehow we've turned this into where we believe a couple facts about Jesus, but then we just really try hard not to cuss. Like that's how it's all devolved down to somehow that's Christianity. When Jesus is calling us to lay down our lives to follow him in absolutely every way, every corner of my heart is his. See, somewhere along the way, we jettisoned this essential message of Jesus for one that's easier. You just come forward at the end of a service, repeat this prayer, get baptized, get your fire insurance, and then go on your life and live it however you want to. The problem with that is that we have unwittingly enabled thousands of people to feel wrongly assured about their relationship with Jesus. And don't think we're just talking about everybody out there. It happens in here too. 
So what Jesus says in Luke 14 about following him must be part of this equation. We cannot pull back from the radical nature of Jesus' words where he says, if you want to be my follower, then everything else is put in second place. But as I say that, this truth can lead to another way. We get confused in all of this because we hear that and we start to think Jesus is teaching some kind of a workspace salvation here. Like if I give up all this stuff, then I can be saved. Okay, God, what you're asking me to do is sell everything and that will get me salvation. That's, that's how our minds tend to go as sinful humans. We, we, we jump there that Jesus is saying, earn it. No, actually what he's teaching here is that if someone is going to follow him, if someone is going to be his disciple, then they would do all of this in response to who he is and to his salvation. That they would see him as that and then we'd say, well, yep, everything else is his. That, they, that they've been so changed in their heart that they see him as better. So they're willing. That's what Jesus is doing here as he slices away at easy believism, as he says these hard words. Yes, they're hard. Yes, I wrestled with these. I struggled with this all week. Like These things are hard to hear, but as we see them, as we think about the hate-love thing, by implication then, what Jesus is saying is something must be worth it on the other end of this. Right? You get that logically? That if Jesus is asking us to die on a cross painfully, when he knows it's hard for us to choose him over everything else, when he knows that, that we're going to fear loss, we're going to fear lack, that we're not going to have what everybody else has, we're not going to get to do what everybody else is getting to do, and we're going to fear that. We're going to say, what if I lose my kids? What if, we're going to fear those things. Yes, in all of that, first of all, we know it must be supernatural work of God for us to choose that because that's not really that appealing, not really attractive it's not an easy message, right? There's a lot of pain and sorrow. If Jesus is calling us to all of that, that's why we must remember the blessing of following Jesus. We cannot forget the blessing of following Jesus, that he's offering something here, not just calling us to give something up. Just think about this. If Jesus is asking us to put our families and our lives and our stuff on the table to put it in second place, then by implication, he is offering something better than all of that. Even the great things, the good things, he's offering something better. He's saying, I am better. He's offering a more desirable option than all of these things that could let you down. Don't put your hope in this. Put your hope in me. That'll let you down. I will never let you down. I am enough. See, kids, I think you especially, but all of us, need to understand this about God. He's not up there some cosmic killjoy just with a smirk on his face hoping you suffer. Like he's not Sid from Toy Story. Remember that the toy, right? And you're the toy and you're, you, that's not God. Listen to who God is. This is Ephesians chapter one. Just listen to the blessing that God's heart is for you and for me. Read the whole book, but first Ephesians one, three through six. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Is that not an incredibly beneficial relationship? 
Like you read the rest of it later, it talks about redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our sins, wisdom from above, an eternal inheritance, his spirit inside of us. Like those are amazing blessings, right? And so yes, this is a dear cost. It will cost us dearly to follow Jesus. But remember, in that we get God. It's what Spurgeon said a couple hundred years ago, how much the gain exceeds the loss. How much the gain of seeing and loving Jesus above all else exceeds anything he would ask of me to give away. But then here's what's interesting about this. When you slot things correctly, when you order your life correctly, and you love Jesus so much, it seems like you hate everything else, and, and you put him first, every decision you make is through him and for him, and everything else comes underneath that and fits in accordingly. When you do that, all of those other things are blessed accordingly. They're actually gonna function right. They're actually going to be healthy and blessed by God in that. Like when, you, when your spouse sees your heart transformed because you're putting Jesus first, man, think of how that just knits your relationship together that much more. When your coworkers see you as a single woman live a satisfied life, they are intrigued because they can't figure that one out. Think of your kids growing up knowing 100% that Jesus was the king of your house because you decided we're never going to miss church for a sport or an activity. And they know 100% mom and dad pursued Jesus. That was first. Your friends at school see what it looks like to truly be a believer in Christ because you're actually putting him first over anything else and they are changed by that. Your money begins to, to take on a new purpose. Your job, your hobbies, all of that now flows through the filter of glorifying God and living for his mission. Think how blessed all of that stuff is in light of that. See, Jesus was not sitting at that table just pointing out all that was wrong with me. His question of am I enough was offering something better, was offering his blessing on my life. That's why I'm comfortable stepping into this role of follower and not just be a fan, where Jesus is number one over everything else and, and I put everything second. That's, that's why I can do it, it's because I have confidence that he is enough, that he is better, that there's nothing else I could pursue that's better than him. So listen, if, if you're sitting there right now and you're not sure whether you're a follower or a fan, just reflect on this question for a second. Has the, the faith that you proclaim, that you claim to be a believer, has that cost you anything? Externally with others, internally in your own heart, in your life, has it cost you anything? Has it asked you of anything? If it hasn't, it might not be true faith in Jesus. Because this is what we've just seen from Jesus, right? There's a cost involved. And so the answer for you, if you see that and you're like, it hasn't really cost me, it hasn't changed me, it hasn't done anything in my life, if that's your answer, the answer for you and the answer for every single one of us is to see Jesus as supreme, to see him as number one, and then to turn from that sin and that selfishness and to turn to his life, death, and resurrection in my place, in your place, to turn to that and to say, Jesus, you are my boss, you are the master, you're my Lord and Savior. That's the answer that he will then say, all right, you're in. But I want you to remember this. As you consider that, 
as I consider that, as we walk in this road, remember this. As he's calling us to follow him, like he has described here, Jesus is not asking us to do anything he has not done first. He left heaven. He left his father. He he took all of the things of the world and renounced them. He didn't own anything. He was never married. He never looked to anything as his source. And then he was willing to die on a cross. Not for his own sin, but for your sin and my sin. He did everything he is asking of us. And so, yes, his costly grace does lead to a costly call that you must see him as enough. You must renounce all the rights to your life. Yes, grace leads to that cost, but he also empowers us to do it. Luke 18, Jesus says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. I, I looked at this all week. You look at this right now. The man, that's impossible. Jesus, you're asking me to do something I could never do. You're right. What is impossible with man is possible with God. So when you count the cost, when you hear the call to follow him, give your life to him and trust him, he's gonna empower you to do it. How do I make that? How do I give that up? Jesus says, let me. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. He's like, I know you can't do it. Let me do it through you. But this is the cost. This is the call. Let's see him as worthy today.